According to Medicare statistics, abdominal pain and chest pain are the two most common diagnoses presenting to emergency rooms. According to those same statistics, adults with back pain make up most complaints to family physicians' offices, which is outpatient data. Whether you're going to practice family medicine or pediatrics, a solid understanding of the physical exam, imaging requirements, and possible causes of adult or pediatric abdominal complaints is a necessity, and making the decision for surgery isn't always going to be easy. The focus here is on adult diseases. We might mention a few diseases affecting children, for example, appendicitis, intussusception, malrotation, pyloric stenosis, gastroschisis, emphalocele, and maybe a few others, but we're not going to prioritize children over the adults, at least not today. Welcome to this presentation on abdominal pain. Hopefully, you'll have a better understanding of your physical examination and diagnoses accompanying your patient's screams. By the end of this presentation and the accompanying alternative learning activity, you should have a better understanding of the reasoning needed by the clinician in determining whether a patient requires an operation or not. Also included in a separate PDF file, you have 10 practice questions to help you prepare for the exam. The flow chart on slide five for abdominal pain presented in this lecture is not really user friendly and I can promise you that it wasn't designed by a surgeon. Simply, it would be easier to have a single pain flow chart broken down by anatomical body part. But it is what it is, and because of this flow chart, there's a lot of overlap in how we try to categorize patients with different types of abdominal pain. We'll walk through some cases, talk about the useful imaging, whether it is acute or chronic pain or both, whether it's generalized, localized, or psychological in in origin, and finally we'll discuss what peritoneal signs are and what causes peritonitis. If you don't remember what the peritoneum is or the retroperitoneum is, go back and look at the garbage can analogy presented to you early on and check out slide 30 of this presentation. A review there might be of help. If you want to review this anatomy, please check out the explanation at the link given in the comments section. In addition to the patient presenting with acute or chronic abdominal pain, we'll look at referred pain, what it is and what causes it, and some examples. The underlying principles of physiology and anatomy causing abdominal pain will be introduced. And of course, we'll look at what imaging studies are most useful in assessing a patient presenting with abdominal pain, whether it is acute, chronic, referred, psychological, or otherwise. These readings are recommended. They're not required, but if you're a gunner, you'll probably want to take a look at least at the first one. I'll provide these to you as PDFs if you would like to peruse them. The first branch point of this flowchart, and please do not memorize these flowcharts, send us to look at whether a patient is most likely complaining of an acute episode or a chronic exacerbation of a pre-existing condition causing the patient's discomfort. And sometimes you can have acute on chronic symptoms. The chart then splits into generalized, localized, and according to this flowchart at least, referred pain. Referred pain would only be seen in a patient with acute pain. I'm not sure this is completely true. I think this will make more sense later as we move through some of the clinical cases and the examples. Whether a patient presents with acute pain or an acute exacerbation of a chronic condition will make our first decision point a bit easier. Chronic abdominal pain usually allows a bit more time for a more complete workup. Acute pain and a patient in extremis can result in a true emergency if not acted upon immediately. We'll also mention the surgical abdomen. But as a surgeon, it's a term I loathed. Not every patient presenting with signs of acute abdominal pain will have an abdomen requiring surgical intervention. It's not a very good term at describing the abdominal examination. The point of this slide, however, is simple. Acute pain can be urgent. 
There are many reasons a patient can develop abdominal pain, both physiologically, structurally, congenitally, or immunologically. The flowchart seems to break down abdominal pain by whether it is acute, chronic, localized, or generalized. In truth, it isn't how I think about it. Most of the time, after the history and physical exam, you begin to make an educated guess as to why the patient has abdominal pain. Do they booze and smoke? Then probably peptic ulcer disease. Do they have a known history of an autoimmune disorder? Rheumatoid arthritis. Then you're thinking immunologically like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Have they had chemotherapy recently? Then maybe they have tiflitis, which is inflammation of the cecum in patients receiving chemo. What about diabetes? And they might have gastroparesis, ketoacidosis, or a host of other electrolyte abnormalities. The photo of the child here with lead poisoning reveals only a few of the problems with lead exposure. In addition to poor dentition in patients with, with lead exposure, demineralization of the enamel occurs, and they can also present with acute abdominal pain. And you can see, based on my reasoning, using the patient's medical history and old records, have they had a recent upper or lower endoscopy? You'll begin to diagnose quickly and hopefully accurately. What are the mechanisms of abdominal pain? Nerve irritation or injury, such as the rash caused by herpes zoster, or pain from a pinched nerve can lead to abdominal pain. We see several mechanisms listed causing abdominal discomfort. Nerve irritation, muscle injury, referred pain from a source outside of the abdomen, and psychological distress can all cause abdominal pain. Here are other examples of the mechanisms of abdominal pain. Nerve irritation, trauma, like a rectus sheath hematoma, referred pain, and a rather common cause of abdominal pain in mostly, but not always, young high school aged and college aged women, psychopathology. You have to think about the power of the mind over the body because it's a very real entity. One of the major causes of abdominal pain is caused by distension, by blood, fluid, or air of the intestine. Even an ileus, which is a sick or paralyzed intestine, secondary to say the stomach flu, can cause abdominal pain. This slide shows us several etiologies of intestinal distension. It is this distension of the bowel and subsequent pressing on the parietal peritoneum that causes the abdominal discomfort. Several other mechanisms can cause abdominal pain and the photos are an attempt at demonstrating the serious nature of these cases. For example, intestinal obstruction caused by a tumor or a volvulus, a twist of the intestine, or even an obstructed ureter can cause abdominal pain. When an abdominal organ loses its blood supply or has a diminished blood supply, catastrophic results can occur. These images shows us a closed loop obstruction, i.e. a volvulized segment of small bowel and infarcted intestine. Both would be surgical emergencies. Sometimes a perforation can cause feces, blood, or bacteria to gain free access to the abdomen, causing an abscess. Even stomach acid or bile can leak from a perforation causing significant irritation of the peritoneal cavity, i.e. the glad bag analogy causing peritonitis. So go here at the link on the bottom of this slide to watch this glad bag analogy that explains the peritoneum and the a subsequent ability of the intestines to cause havoc on the peritoneal lining. Of course, vascular insufficiency, such as the intestines shown in this photo, can also be a source of acute abdominal pain. Examining a patient in extremis, whether it is from a heart attack, loss of blood from an auto accident or a rupturing abdominal aortic aneurysm may require you to take a history and physical exam all at the same time. Taking an exam while you're talking to a patient 
and not losing your train of thought takes practice. Sometimes you simply will not have time to take any history and you'll be forced to act without knowing any of the patient's medical history or allergy history. It isn't ideal, but in those cases, you're trying to save a life rapidly. Ideally, you'll attempt to get the best medical history possible from the patient, including the chief complaint, and if there is time, the seven basic descriptive criteria of that chief complaint. In addition, it may be helpful to ascertain the sequence of symptoms. When did they first occur? Have you ever had pain like this before? If yes, when? Of course, asking whether a patient has developed fever or rigors can hint as to an infectious cause of the abdominal pain and obstipation can point to a bowel obstruction. Stones, whether they're kidney stones or gall stones, can present other diagnostic challenges. Just because a patient has gall stones or kidney stones does not necessarily mean that they need to be removed urgently. Many, if not most, are asymptomatic and found incidentally while looking for other causes of pain. It's easy to forget to ask these questions, especially if the patient is an extremist, but they could be important. Get into the habit of asking your female patients about their pregnancy history, abortion history, or their menstrual irregularities, menorrhagia, metarrhagia, amenorrhea, or dysmenorrhea. A sudden onset of abdominal girth or an asymmetric leg swelling can be a sign of ovarian or other gynecological malignancies. The image at the bottom right shows a necrotic umbilical lymph node, the Sister Mary Joseph's node, often seen in ovarian or gastric or even other intra-abdominal malignancies. It's interestingly though, the clinical sign later that became known as the Sister Mary Joseph's nodule was named after Sister Mary Joseph Dempsey, who died in 1939. She was a surgical assistant of Dr. William James Mayo of the Mayo Clinic. She first noticed the association between abdominal pelvic malignancies and metastatic abdominal nodules. Let's start down the pathway of acute abdominal pain. This refers to pain of acute onset generally less than 24 hours. Examples include appendicitis, acute cholecystitis, ectopic pregnancy, sigmoid or cecal volvulus, perforated diverticulitis, perforated duodenal ulcer, and less lethal causes of acute abdominal pain, such as adhesive bowel disease, which can lead to a small bowel obstruction. A glaring deficiency in the flow chart is lack of any attention given to the pediatric patient, the patient who can't voice their discomfort to you, a baby, or even a comatose trauma patient. What then? Pediatric abdominal findings range from a phalliceal to gastroschisis to a midgut volvulus and pyloric stenosis or necrotizing intercolitis. It's a big list. So, no, I don't really like this flow chart, but nobody asked for my opinion, so we'll work with the tools given to us. There are some causes of acute abdominal pain which require immediate intervention or the patient can quickly die. Examples such as a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, infarcted bowel, either from embolic or atherosclerotic vascular disease. The saying, quote, pain out of proportion to the abdominal exam findings, end quote, is a huge red flag. The exam in an elderly patient can be misleading as they writhe and scream in pain while your examination of their abdomen shows a doughy soft abdomen. This is usually a sign indicative of vascular compromise. Here are some examples of emergent and urgent repairs. Vascular compromise of small bowel, electrical burns requiring escharotomies, congenital diaphragmatic hernia repair in a baby or an infant. And here's an image just taken from a pediatric ICU with all of the supporting technology that we use today to try to save these lives. Our rapid decision making requires that we act immediately and monitor them and get a surgical referral if it's indicated. Look at each image and tell me what your thoughts are. Can they wait? Do they need an operation? Are they emergent? 
or urgent? Are they elective? Do we have time? So let's practice a bit. Which one of these patients with an acute injury seems to require immediate attention and possibly operative intervention? Which ones can you triage without further history taking? So let's take a minute to read each of the common diagnoses found in the nine quadrants of this abdomen. We rarely speak of nine quadrants. More commonly, we use only four, right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, and left lower quadrant, and the umbilicus, acting as the intersection point of the four quadrants. But look closely at these diagnoses that don't quite seem to fit in the quadrant where the associated organ is located. Pancreatitis in the right upper quadrant, for example. Biliary colic in the left upper quadrant doesn't seem to fit either. You have to keep an open mind when assessing the patient with abdominal pain. Learning about referred pain only makes your job more difficult. We'll address that in a minute. What kinds of abdominal pain present as generalized pain? Which kind present as localized? What types of abdominal pain would be presented by an acute pain episode of what was a generalized pain that later localizes. Appendicitis is the best example of this later type of pain. Pain that is generalized in the abdomen, usually around the umbilicus, and then later localizes to the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. According to the flow chart, the pain is gonna be either localized or generalized. Let's look at some pathologies presenting often, but not always, as localized abdominal pain. The bare area of the liver. Ever wonder why we teach this? I often did. I remember as a first year student putting my hand in the abdomen of our cadaver, reading the dissector with our classmates, and feeling, but not seeing, the bare area of the liver. I had no idea why we were learning this. 20 years later, I know. The bare area of the liver creates an argument that the liver is retroperitoneal, except for this crown-shaped area at the apex of the liver that is not covered by peritoneum. Most anatomists will tell you that area and that area only is the retroperitoneal portion of the liver. So what? Well, the liver is intra-abdominal, but the bare area has no visceral or parietal peritoneal innervation. It's insensate to pain. And because of this, cancer or an injury could occur here and get large by the time it grows large enough to stimulate the surrounding visceral peritoneum. So when a patient walks in and has a giant metastatic liver lesion and you say to yourself, how could they ever have let it get this big? Well, they didn't. They couldn't feel it growing. No pain fibers in the bare area of the liver. Now you know. There are a lot of signs to learn. We'll go through each of these in your physical diagnosis of the abdomen. Murphy's sign, acute cholecystitis, the halting of the deep breath in inspiration when palpating the right upper quadrant because of the pain of a hot gallbladder. McBurney's sign, pain in the right lower quadrant, basically localized guarding secondary to appendicitis. Rovsing sign, pain in the right lower quadrant while pushing on the left lower quadrant. Gray Turner sign, flank bruising secondary to hemorrhagic pancreatitis. CVA tenderness, usually a significant finding for hydronephrosis, kidney stones, or pyelonephritis. Obturator sign, Pain in the obturator canal on medial rotation of the hip with flexion of the hip used to identify retroperitoneal appendicitis. That is when the tip of the appendix is in the retroperitoneum or subsecal and not intraperitoneal. We've already spoken briefly about the rigid abdomen caused by perforated viscera. Interestingly, a patient with cancer which is spread all over the peritoneum may have a completely benign abdominal exam. Again, the exam is imperfect, but done well, it can guide you to make an accurate and safe diagnosis. The imperfections of the abdominal exam 
have created a saying all general surgeons know. Quote, it's easy to know when to operate on a patient. The difficult part is knowing when not to operate, end quote. This picture on the right shows metastatic gastric cancer. The entire peritoneum is covered and matted with metastatic disease. This patient most likely has a benign abdominal exam and they probably present bloated because they have intra-abdominal ascites floating inside the peritoneal cavity. So, which peritoneal lining is inflamed? Is it the parietal peritoneum, the visceral lining, the intestinal distension, or both acting together? The physical examination may not tell you. Actually, in fact, it probably won't tell you. Rebound tenderness. More pain on the release of pressure seems to suggest visceral irritation, but not always. Guarding is usually a result of muscle rigidity because the entire parietal peritoneum is inflamed from, say, acid spilling as a result of a gastric perforation. What we're really trying to do is decide on whether the patient requires more imaging or a trip to the operating room without any further diagnostic intervention. Sometimes we're wrong, but CT scanning, the preferred method of imaging for most GI complaints, has decreased the number of negative appendectomies and has virtually made the, quote, exploratory laparotomy, end quote, a thing of the past. So here's the technical stuff about guarding and rebound. And the last paragraph here is actually the most important. Somatic nerves that innervate the parietal peritoneum also supply the corresponding segment areas of skin and muscles. So when the parietal peritoneum is irritated, muscles tend to contract reflexively, causing localized hypercontractility, otherwise known as guarding. So we know the par parietal peritoneum is innervated by branches from somatic efferent and afferent nerves that also supply the muscles and skin respectively of the overlying abdominal wall. And the visceral peritoneum is innervated by branches of visceral afferent nerves, which travel with the autonomic supply to the underlying viscera. This last paragraph is the most important. Make sure you understand this before you move on. The fact that your patient has generalized pain with peritonitis really doesn't help you in your diagnosis. A patient with a perforated duodenal ulcer spilling acid can cause a diffusely rigid abdomen. Even more, a patient with diffuse vomiting from gastroenteritis, i.e. the stomach flu, can present with generalized pain and peritoneal signs, guarding or rebound. It's because of this ambiguity that I like to teach future physicians to always dictate in their notes, quote, the abdominal examination suggests peritonitis with guarding or rebound, end quote. This little bit of wiggle room and or ambiguity in your dictation can allow you and or the surgeon to not compromise the patient's care if they discover a non-lethal diagnosis such as constipation or middle schmerz. The patient who presents like this, i.e. don't touch me, ouch, hurts all over the abdomen, consistent with usually a perforation and contamination of the entire abdomen, like a perforated duodenal ulcer, spilling acid stomach contents into the peritoneal cavity. These patients truly have a rigid board-like abdomen, but you can see this with a bowel obstruction where distension of the visceral peritoneum can actually cause translocation of bacteria through the bowel wall. This bacteria can then cause a fibrinous exudate over the intestines. In taking the brief history and inspection of the abdomen, you must sometimes rapidly assess the acuity of the patient's symptoms. Does the abdominal examination suggest diffuse tenderness? Does the patient exhibit generalized guarding or rebound? More pain on withdrawal of the hand than the gentle pressure applied to the abdomen initially by the examiner's hand. 
The patient presenting with generalized abdominal pain with guarding rebound may require urgent intervention, maybe to the point where they bypass all lab and radiographic studies and go straight to the operating room. Examples include a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. They usually present with excruciating back pain with a distended abdomen because of the blood collecting in the retroperitoneum, or blood in the peritoneal cavity as a result of the aneurysm, rupturing the thin membrane of the retroperitoneum. A ruptured perforated duodenal ulcer, acute cholecystitis with rupture of the gallbladder, which is very rare, rupture of a sigmoid diverticulum with generalized fecal peritonitis, or a perforated jejunal diverticula, perforated appendicitis with an abscess formation, which is a difficult diagnosis to make because of the potential locations of the appendix, i.e. is the appendix retroperitoneal, is it subsecal, is it intraperitoneal, or a combination. The point of this slide, however, is this. If a patient presents to your office with unstable vital signs, generalized abdominal pain with guarding or rebound, call 911 and arrange for the patient to be sent to the hospital immediately. What about the patient who presents complaining of abdominal pain, but there is no guarding or rebound? Generalized pain without peritoneal signs could be an absolute emergency too. We often describe this exam as, quote, pain out of proportion to the exam findings, end quote. Most commonly, this type of exam is seen in elderly patients who have suffered, as we mentioned earlier, a vascular insult, an embolic clot to the superior mesenteric artery, atherosclerotic occlusion of the SMA or other vessels, infarcted intestines from an internal hernia, or a volvulus, or a volvulus of the stomach, or small bowel, or a colon. An internal hernia is where a loop of bowel becomes entangled through a hole in the mesentery, just like think of your garden hose. You carefully gather the hose, but for some unknown reason, when you unwind the hose, a loop gets caught in the coils of the hose. Same idea. This slide demonstrates some causes of abdominal pain that may present without guarding a rebound. Sore muscles from too many sit-ups or frequent coughing. These are patients who may present with signs suggesting a surgical or an acute abdomen, but you don't want to take them to the operating room. There's nothing to operate on. The lower image on the right shows a rectus sheath hematoma, the white square, with a blush of contrast within the abdominal wall muscle. This tells us there is fresh blood or active bleeding within the rectus sheath. The pain is akin sort of like a compartment syndrome of the rectus muscle. The red arrows demonstrate either a fecal lift within the appendix, a small cecal diverticulum, or the common iliac vein or contrast within the patient's right ureter. It's hard to tell based on just one image. Abdominal pain referred to or from another area of the body can be frustrating to work up. Several good examples come to mind. The patient with left upper quadrant abdominal pain secondary to a left lower lobe pneumonia. Another example is the patient who presents with generalized acute pain, eventually focusing around the belly button. This could be an early appendicitis, and by the time it localizes to the right lower quadrant, it may have perforated. Thus, generalized pain being referred to the belly button, an embryological highway left over from gut rotation. What about epigastric abdominal pain, thought to be gastritis or peptic ulcer disease, when in actuality, it's an inferior wall heart attack, causing diaphragmatic irritation and hence vomiting. And the more vomiting, the soreness of the abdominal muscles. Lots of physicians have lost lawsuits over spending too much time looking for abdominal pain when it's actually cardiac or chest pain. Here are some examples of diagnoses referred to the abdomen from other sources. Another example in the female, cystitis. It often presents as dysuria, painful urination, and or pain above the pubis with localization to the right or left abdomen, leading to a workup for possible appendicitis or an abscess of a fallopian tube. Same with an ectopic pregnancy, generalized abdominal pain, and only later with pain localizing to the right lower quadrant or deep in the pelvis.
is that heartburn really reflux disease? Or is that pneumonia really pneumonia? Or just atelectasis, secondary to being unable to take a deep breath because of chest pain? Let's walk through these different sort of unreliable signs you'll learn about in your medical skills course. These are commonly assessed and the findings dictated in the medical record. Kerr sign, Murphy sign, Lloyd sign, Rothsing sign, obturator sign, etc. They can be overwhelming and are often only marginally useful in coming to a diagnosis. Remember though, Medicine was barbaric up until the discovery of CT and ultrasound in the late 70s. Before then, if you had a Ravsing sign, a normal white count, and no fever, you might go to the operating room for an exploratory laparotomy, otherwise known as, let's open up the abdomen and go take a look. At one time, over 30% of such operations showed no findings requiring surgery. A nice chart. Kerr sign is commonly encountered after laparoscopic surgery. The patient often has referred pain to the supraclavicular area and or the scapular area from retained air as a result of the operation. We use carbon dioxide to blow up or insufflate the abdomen to allow the laparoscopic procedure to proceed. Let's look at the acute abdomen. They present with generalized pain, no guarding, no rebound, and no rigidity. This is why I don't like the term surgical abdomen, being used as a synonym for an acute abdomen. Over the next few slides, we'll see examples of patients presenting with an acute but non-surgical abdomen. Of course, CT scanning has provided us with immense information to sort out the acute from the surgical abdomen. Imagine being a victim of gastroenteritis, food poisoning, or a food allergy, resulting in nausea, vomiting, or maybe diarrhea. The sore abdominal muscles from vomiting could be mistaken for guarding or localized pain. Vomiting could result in a rectus hematoma too, tender, distended, and maybe a quiet abdomen. These are the patients we don't want to operate on. And thankfully, they rarely end up there today. But sometimes we don't know what the pain is from. And the CT scan, labs, and physical exam leave us confused. For those patients, a diagnostic laparoscopy can be done. Laparoscopy, not laparotomy using a camera or an endoscope without completely opening the greater sac and performing a hands-on exploration. These disorders are usually heralded first by diarrhea and later bloating and or vomiting. Sometimes it is vomiting and then diarrhea with the pain occurring only after the bouts of emesis. But these are soft diagnostic signs. Either way, the examination may show a doughy, soft abdomen with guarding or rebound or rigidity. In these patients, we'll need to rely on the history, the exam, the normal abdominal films, and the normal complete blood count with a normal white count. I think it's always in the best interest of the patient when they present with abdominal pain or chest pain and you can't give them a definitive diagnosis from the ER to admit them for observation. It's just safer in good medicine. That little bit of extra time allows for intravenous hydration, antibiotics if indicated, and pain control. And sometimes it allows for a psychiatric evaluation too. Constipation as a cause of abdominal discomfort is common. Sometimes it is impressive how bad the constipation is based on the interpretation of the abdominal films. These patients ironically present with diarrhea. How can that be? Well, it's called overflow diarrhea. Sometimes these patients require manual disimpaction in the operating room under anesthesia. Other times, a gastrographin enema will do the trick. As a rule, however, these patients should be cleared of their fecal load from below, 
Avoid giving medications orally as it will usually not work and only increase the cramping abdominal pain and distension. And further, what if there is an obstruction in the distal colon? You don't want to cause a perforation by trying to clean out such a patient from above orally by giving cathartics. Truthfully, women present with abdominal pain are often the largest diagnostic challenges. Of course, don't forget the pregnancy test, even if they tell you they've had a tubal ligation to prevent pregnancies. If the pregnancy test is negative, proceed normally in your diagnostic workup. Most gynecologists prefer a pelvic exam be performed in conjunction with a pelvic ultrasound. Personally, I find CT scanning easier to interpret for me, but that isn't true for most gynecologists as they truly are experts at female pelvic ultrasonography. We used to give an entire lecture devoted to chronic abdominal pain. I think it's easier to show examples of chronic pain than try to explain all the diagnoses supporting chronic abdominal pain. And yet, here on the flowchart, it doesn't recognize chronic referred pain. Hmm, seems like we left something out. This pattern of logic, acute abdominal pain with localized signs of peritoneal irritation is a classic presentation that we teach medical students representing the patient who needs immediate surgical consultation. But you probably already guessed that isn't always the case, so let's keep trudging on. Right upper quadrant pain with peritoneal signs can be acute cholecystitis, pneumonia, Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome, perforated peptic ulcer or gastritis, and a host of other pathologies. Just because the classic finding is a hot gallbladder by no means represents the only thought you might have here. Remember, that's why you get paid the big bucks to think about the rare and the weird stuff too. Cholelithiasis doesn't usually present with pain if it stones in the common bile duct chronically. It usually presents with jaundice and mild tenderness, but not rebound. If an ultrasound shows an enlarged common bile duct greater than eight millimeters, and or the presence of stones in the common bile duct, our diagnosis is made. But what about cancer at the ampulla? These patients may or may not present with a Murphy sign on physical exam. The image on the lower middle area shows an ERCP, an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatogram. See if you can identify the anatomy here. Here's the endoscope through the stomach down into the duodenum. The cannula is entering the common bile duct and the common pancreatic duct near the ampulla of Vater, cannulizing past the sphincter of Odi, and imaging the common bile duct, the cystic duct and the gallbladder, and the common hepatic duct with the left and right common hepatic ducts. Here we see the common pancreatic duct. Pain, fever, jaundice, hepatitis, gallstones, cancer. We'll see that painless jaundice usually means cancer. What do we call that sign on physical exam? We call it a Courvoisier sign. If our physical exam suggests localized tenderness in the right upper quadrant or no pain with jaundice, we need to think about imaging options. These four procedures as listed on this slide are the most commonly used to image biliary anatomy. Ultrasonography, CT scanning, here we can see a stone in the common bile duct, MRCP, which has a greater sensitivity than 90% and requires no iodinated contrast or invasive procedures, basically in this MRCP, it's an MRI of the upper abdomen and of the biliary ducts. And as we mentioned before, an ERCP. An ERCP deserves consideration if a non-invasive procedure is not successful in diagnosing. Sensitivity exceeds 90% and an ERCP can perform a sphincterotomy, 
at the same time to allow those stones to pass through the sphincter of Odi. If we're thinking about gastritis, epigastric pain, what could be other causes of the patient's symptoms? Pneumonia, biliary tract disease, peptic ulcer, splenomegaly, hepatitis, gastric cancer, GI bleeding, or pancreatitis. This image shows hemorrhagic gastritis. Complications of peptic ulcer disease, bleeding, perforation, obstruction, reflux. How would each be diagnosed? How would you treat each of them? What can you think of that would cause gastric outlet obstruction? Here's an image of gastric outlet obstruction. Something is blocking this outlet of the stomach at the pyloric level. Could it be gastric ulcers? Could it be duodenal ulcers? Could it be cancer of the stomach? SMA syndrome, maybe even a prior vagotomy. Without emptying, think about this one. Why wouldn't the stomach empty if I cut the vagus nerves? Think about this for a second. What about reflux disease? How do we diagnose it and how do we treat it? This is a picture of a Nissen fundal plication. The stomach cardia is wrapped around the distal esophagus. This helps prevent reflux into the esophagus. This slide serves to remind us that not all abdominal pain is secondary to the GI tract. In fact, sometimes it is gynecological in origin. Don't forget this. An example of gynecological pathology that can cause abdominal pain, ovarian torsion. Here, the red arrow is showing the area of torsion, and we see on the right the necrotic fallopian tube. Let's look at some psychological etiologies of abdominal pain. Many times the physical exam history and findings are all inconsistent with each other. Don't forget, depression can manifest as bodily complaints. These somatoform disorders are very real. Sometimes it is simply a clinician's astute pattern recognition of a patient's presentation leading him or her to a diagnosis of psychologically induced distress. Remember, you should always be thinking, how can I support my suspicions for the diagnosis I'm entertaining? What imaging studies do I need? What lab studies will help me? What physical exam findings are consistent with my suspicions? An acute exacerbation of a chronic condition is quite real. The patient's medical, surgical, and social histories, along with a complete physical exam, will likely lead to the correct diagnoses. In the workup of chronic abdominal pain, we often obtain the usual labs, and sometimes it's necessary for us to obtain upper and lower endoscopies, such as a sigmoidoscopy or a colonoscopy. And of course, imaging, CT, ultrasound, and MRI are the most commonly used. Chronic abdominal pain, i.e. a functional cause, is often seen with irritable bowel syndrome. If you'd like to read more about irritable bowel syndrome, you can click on the article and download it. Please don't memorize these Rome criteria. They're here just as a review for you. Ulcerative colitis also carries with it an increased risk of cancer, especially if a patient's had the disease for a long time. Ulcerative colitis typically occurs in adolescence or young adulthood. The longer the patient has the disease, the higher their risk of cancer. When we're discussing inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, note how the two diseases differ. In ulcerative colitis, the rectum is always involved and it may be spared in Crohn's disease. The rectum is always involved with ulcerative colitis and it's almost always limited to the descending colon and rectum, whereas Crohn's disease can occur 
anywhere in the GI tract. The mouth, the anus, the stomach, the duodenum. Crohn's can have skip lesions and may be seen with fistula between organs or even anal fistula and crypt abscesses in the small bowel. The terminal ileum is most often affected by Crohn's disease. That's how it got its name, terminal ileitis. Whereas in ulcerative colitis, the small bowel is not affected. Autoimmune disorders and inflammatory bowel disorders are often seen together. Autoimmune disorders such as arthritis, ankylizing spondylitis, uveitis or Reiter syndrome, erythema nodosum, or even aphthous ulcerations, i.e. Crohn's disease, and pyoderma gangrenosum are often seen in these autoimmune disorders and in patients who have concurrent ulcerative colitis and even Crohn's disease. There are several extra intestinal manifestations which occur in 15 to 20 percent of cases. Here's an example of systemic Crohn disease. This patient is experiencing the long-standing complications of Crohn disease. The CT scan shows the fistula between the skin and the underlying parotid gland. It's truly a horrible disease. With chronic abdominal pain, patients are usually approached the same way. History and physical exam, same lab studies, maybe even imaging, perhaps even genetic testing and procedures, sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy, ERCP or an upper GI series with barium, and of course, imaging with CAT scan or ultrasound or even MRI. So in the acute generalized or localized abdominal pain, let's take a look and see what your impressions would be of patients presenting like this. The purpose of this presentation has been an attempt at making you think like, an ish, like a clinician. How can you put all your patient's information together to order the proper diagnostic studies? Do you need a consultant? What imaging studies? What invasive studies? Students often find this long presentation difficult to synthesize because the information isn't about each pathological process, but rather is about making a diagnosis and forming the pattern recognition need to support these diagnoses. Remember, you have the rest of your career to see each of these diagnoses, examine your patients, and to work them up. Here's an example of a gangrenous gallbladder. This patient may actually present with a completely benign abdominal exam, a piece of infarcted small bowel. This patient may present with pain out of proportion to their findings if it's secondary to a embolism to the SMA, and of course, appendicitis and a ruptured aneurysm. All of these will gain your attention very quickly. The next several slides consist of alphabetical listing of new terms introduced in this presentation. If you know what each of these terms represent and why they're clinically important, you'll do fine on your exams. There are some terms listed here which are not specifically defined in the presentation. You'll need to look them up or refer to other lectures given by other faculty where the terms may have been defined. The image at the top right shows the stages of infl inflammation in cholecystitis from a normal gallbladder on the left to gangrene on the right. Each can present the same or differently. The bare area of the liver is shown on the bottom right. Again, why do we care? Because there's no peritoneal covering here and hence no pain fibers. More terms, you can read them over. CT scan here shows a whorl sign, which is usually consistent of volvulus, either mesenteric volvulus, small bowel, or vascular. It is seen in bowel obstructions. Notice the subhepatic space. It doesn't look right at all. I'm not sure what's going on here, but it probably is a collection of fluid or pus. The image of the infant demonstrates the treatment for a gastroschisis or an emphalocele. It shows a silo of cheesecloth or plastic. Every day the silo is twisted to slowly reintroduce the baby's intestines back into the abdominal cavity. Gastrographin, which we've mentioned, is a thick iodine-containing 
clear fluid used by radiologists to image the GI tract. It's also a wonderful oral laxative, and it's also useful in reducing bowel obstructions and helping to resolve an ileus. The CT scan here at the top right demonstrates a gallstone ileus. This is a pathological condition where a large gallstone is so big it erodes through the gallbladder via a fistula between the gallbladder and the duodenum. The gallstone travels into the small bowel and it gets stuck at the terminal ileum. Classic findings of a gallstone ileus, it isn't an ileus, it's an obstruction, are pneumobilia, air in the bile duct secondary to the cholecystoenteric fistula, a bowel obstruction, and the findings of the large gallstone. To learn more, I've given you a link. The image on the lower right shows hemorrhagic gastritis. More terms. The image at the top right shows an example of nutcracker syndrome where the superior mesenteric artery pinches the left renal vein, causing congestion in the kidney and left upper quadrant pain. It's very rare. And of course, we can't forget about macrocytic anemia, the image on the lower right. It's often seen in alcoholics who are deficient in iron, vitamin B12, and folate. And the two images here show a rectus sheath hematoma. This is a cause of severe abdominal pain after some sort of trauma or even coughing, but it requires no specific treatment other than pain medication and perhaps an abdominal binder to compress the vessels in the rectus muscle that are bleeding, the superior and inferior epigastric arteries in their branches. It might be difficult to ascertain between a rectus sheath hematoma and hemorrhagic pancreatitis that presents with a Cullen sign or a Gray-Turner sign. That's covered in my presentation on acute pancreatitis. The image here shows SMA syndrome. Nutcracker syndrome is similar, but here in SMA syndrome, the superior mesenteric artery and or the middle colic artery, the first branch off the SMA, compresses the duodenum and causes a bowel obstruction. This is often seen in patients suffering from severe starvation or intentional starvation, like in the Nazi concentration camps. Nutcracker syndrome refers to compression of the left renal vein by the SMA. SMA syndrome refers to compression of the duodenum by the SMA. Both are quite rare. Here we have a tubo ovarian abscess, top left, uveitis on the top right, often seen with Reiter's syndrome. And the visceral peritoneum is the green coloring here in the bottom left photo and free intraperitoneal air due to a bowel perforation. Air in the stomach is normal. Air over the liver is not normal. This is free air and suggests a perforated bowel. Here's the new terms. If you'd like to download them, double click on the icon. If you have any questions, please contact me. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and give yourself time to digest all of this information. You'll have the next 10 years of your career to learn this.